Good evening, everyone. So to start off, I want to make you aware of your ability to be present here and the reason you were able to arrive at this theater in the first place. That reason is you're a homo sapien. You're an intelligent being that's aware of itself. Now, there are no Neanderthals walking through that door. There's a reason why we're the only human species that's alive and operating in this world today. Now, most people can piece together that we came from some, you know, monkey humanoid version of us that was replaced by a superior species and so on, like, you know, this common depiction suggests. And that's not entirely true. You know, the reality is that Several human species coexisted with us. So the logical reason you're here today is that we conquered all of our human contemporaries. But how? Given more thought, you'll realize how unlikely our existence is. I mean, consider this. Let's say you take me, by the way, I'm six foot three. Um, let's say you face me, one-on-one, -on -one, a fight to the death with a mammoth. Now, show of hands, be completely honest, who thinks that I would win? Okay, we got one, thank you. What about me versus a gorilla, or perhaps a lion, or a Neanderthal? So, I mean, I appreciate you all believing in me, but uh, you're somewhat justified. I would lose all of those fights. But for a reason, Homo sapiens weren't the most muscular, they weren't the best adapted to cold, they weren't the best foragers. In fact, they were pretty much faceless creatures in the food chain for hundreds of thousands of years up until very recently. If we're weak as, indivi if we're weak as individuals, what empowers us as a race? The answer to this question, you know, is something that occurred, it's extraordinary, it's something that occurred 70,000 years ago um, that it's amazing. It occurred 70,000 years ago, and it's a small but revolutionary cognitive leap that granted us unprecedented power. Once we gained this power, you know, we destroyed everything in our past. Every behemoth we encountered, we wiped off the face of the earth, including other humans, to whom just thousands of years before, we, were, we would cower in fear. So what was this great power, and what was this grand revolution? Before I answer this question, I need to acknowledge a brilliant thinker of our generation who inspired this TED Talk. His name is Yuval Noah Harari, author of Bestseller Sapiens, which you may have heard of, and this book details you know, the unique history of Homo sapiens. In this presentation, I'll outline the source of our world dominance and you know, the directions that it can take us. So our story begins about 2.5 million years ago in Africa where the genus Homo first appeared. So these archaic humans dispersed, settling Africa, you know, the Middle East, Eurasia, and eventually North America. So each geography that was presented to humans, you know, nature, nature evolved us as per what it demanded from us. So that's how we, you know, branched into multiple species. As per Darwin's theory of natural selection, we can reason that several, that uh, rather, uh, Homo sapiens need to acquire evolutionary traits that gave us survival advantages. Now, some people would attribute our success to the innovation of stone tools and the conquering of fire, but then multiple human species had these technologies available to them. So what was special about us? It turns out we're the only surviving human species today because we have the ability to make up stuff and have everyone believe in it. Really, this is amazing to me. It's certainly not intuitive. I'll illustrate this with an example. Now, that's a familiar figure right there. President Trump. President Trump is an American. You know, in, in America, it's generally commendable to be a patriot, which certainly Mr. Trump is, and he believes in you know, national affairs. He you know, adheres to federal laws, yet there's no there's no evidence, there's no geographical evidence for the actual existence of his homeland called the United States. In fact, America is just an imaginary, it's an imaginary line on the map whose existence has been asserted to us by some authority who we believe in, 
so he's accepted it as universal truth. But the myth of the United States facilitated the cooperation of millions of Americans. Millions of Americans can work in partnership with Mr. Trump because they believe in the entities and the systems that constitute the USA. And this is why you and I are here today. I'll refer back to my one-on-one -on -one example. Um, we already established that I would lose to a, a Neanderthal in a one-on-one -on -one fight to the death. But if you united 1,000 sapiens who believe in defending their forest, let's say, versus 1,000 Neanderthals who can't unite to save their lives, quite literally, then the Neanderthals don't stand a chance. And that's how Homo sapiens came to dominate the world. By about 10,000 BC, we had you know, transcended the food chain, and we had outlived every human species that ever existed on this planet. And this only sprouted from one cognitive ability. We use our myths every day today. They've merged with our sense of reality. In today's era, we use our powers to unite billions within the philosophy that science and technology will make our lives better. But is the cognitive revolution enough to take us to the future? Will what brought us here take us there? Now, today we're living an, in an extraordinary circumstance. and It's incredible. You know, we, we're living in a period of rapid growth, innovation, and production. When I was reading Sapiens, I realized that this is the extraordinary circumstance of humanity. I looked at my own life and noticed that how, how quickly it was changing. I witnessed the, the, the transition from you know, a flip phone to a self-driving car. When I was young, my brother used to have a laptop. You know, it was pretty thick, but um, it had the ability to run video games and you know, listen to music, and you could browse the internet as well. And when I was young, it was just a marvel to me how this machine could work. Well, my point is that we're changing rapidly. We're changing really, really, really fast. The nature of our existence is extremely volatile. It's the product of intelligent design, the human mind, not natural law. And this is why our future is so difficult to predict and adapt to. There are two forces, two emerging forces of this era that are changing our ability to think and work. One concept is AI, artificial intelligence. So what we're doing with AI is essentially outsourcing our decision-making, analytical, and communicative skills to robots. Now, this chart shows a list of jobs that you know, are going to be replaced by AI in the near future. Now, if you look, there are some notable examples, like, um, for example, teaching, uh, um, healthcare, and you know, customer service. You know, jobs that you would think have a human element to them. Can a, can, a, can a robot you know, understand the problem with your broken iPhone? Can a robot understand your complex medical history? You know, the terrifying reality is that not only are robots on par with humans, they're actually exceeding them. Recently, an AI doctor developed by Babylon Health, um, a digital healthcare startup, beat actual human doctors on an exam designed to test diagnostic abilities. Now, if you pair, while this uh, machine is only suitable for medical advice, it's on the verge of diagnosing diseases and even prescribing medicines. If you pair this machine with, let's say, I don't know, biometric sensor implants that monitor your bodily functions, we're looking at an all-available robot machine that has impeccable medical advice. Now, some people are even considering, you know, replacing teachers. You know, China has been testing AI teachers whose algorithms replace personal standard lectures with personalized tutoring. One student actually reported that when utilizing these ultra-specific lessons, he, uh, he actually improved test scores and allowed college admittance. And reliance on AI will only increase in the future. But if our cognitive abilities are transferred to machines, we already know what powers they granted us. Now, I'm not saying that robots will take over the future, but we're toying with the same capability of unifying an army, but this time with immortal machines. And who knows what outcomes will incur from that. 
not only are we revolutionizing our mental capability with AI, we're also changing the fundamental biology of organisms. Now, I want everyone to imagine that you're a superhero and you can have any superpower you want, you know, any combination, is whatever. So for me, I would probably take Tony Stark's intelligence, you know, Spider-Man's web slashing, Hulk's body, and probably Thor's hammer, and obviously Morgan Freeman's voice. But the relevance of this example is that we're doing just that with biotechnology and genetic engineering. We can grow crops in space, have long-lasting fruit. You know, we can, we can develop seeds that are resistant to disease. We're engineering pigs that have a gene that produce bacon with healthy fats. Lab engineering mosquitoes are being released into the wild to limit the spread of Zika. So these biotechnology creations produce unprecedented advantages for human, human health, human nutrition, and productivity. Yet these examples just constitute a speck of our potential in genetics. We're bending biology to our whim and fancy, transcending natural law. And the emergence of AI and the advancements of you know, gen genetic engineering will be realized in our lifetime. You will live to see this change. So where does that leave us? Well, in the future, oh my god, in the future, things get really blurry. Where we separate from robots is their cognitive ability to imagine what cannot be perceived in the real world. A robot cannot love, cannot imagine, cannot you know, believe in God. Will our ability to create myths and stories to push us to transcend the laws of physics, the design of genetic engineering, and the power of algorithm? Will we be able to preserve our consciousness electronically, you know, design our DNA digitally? Or will a technologically superior species emerge and Homo sapiens fight to the death as we have with Neanderthals? It's entirely possible, but no one knows. I mean, is that it? The future of the human race is, what, abject uncertainty? Honestly, yes. The future is now in our hands. The cognitive revolution did its job. We, it got us here. Our future now is determined by the principles we instill in our character and in science. As Abraham Lincoln once famously said, the best way to predict the future is to create it. Thank you.